All right, so welcome back everybody um, after this break. Um, so uh, it's four o'clock and we are going to have uh, our next speaker who is uh, Jeff Krishmar from UC Irvine, uh, currently in, uh, in Washington DC. So the time uh, change isn't as bad as you think. He'll be talking to us about uh, a long-term project that he's been working on the Carlson. Um, which uh, it turns out I know pretty well because I was his uh, 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 nearby his office for uh, many years. Uh, Jeff, I'm looking forward to your talk, and uh, we'll bring your talk to the main stage, and I'll put myself on the side. All right. Well, thank you, Emery, and and all the organizers of, of SNUFA for inviting me. Um, yeah, I, I'm really happy to be here, and. Uh, tell you uh, what the latest is with this spiking neural network simulator that we've been developing for a while, but really in the last few years, it, it's come a long way and become much more mature. So I did want to show you what we've done and, and, uh, and also what you can do if you want to use it yourself. And uh, it's a software package. It's actually a big framework now. Uh, it was designed to to simulate large scale spiking neural nets. Um, and it has a lot of power to do a lot of biologically realistic uh, neuron models and synapse models. Uh, it was nice to see a couple of talks. I'll talk a little bit about it in my talk about axonal delays, but it, it does support axonal delays. Um, it has some plasticity rules and it's expandable. Uh, I think one of the big attractions of it is it's quite efficient uh, on GPUs and CPUs. Uh, also, there's an automated parameter tuning interface, uh, so you can optimize your models uh, um, by, by tuning parameters. And uh, over the years, we've developed a bunch of analysis and visualization tools that go with it. And of course, it's open source, publicly available on GitHub. As Emery said, it's got a long history. Uh, it started at a project back in the United States uh, to support neuromorphic hardware. Uh, and we were supposed to uh, provide spiking neural network applications that were several orders of magnitude larger than the hardware that was being developed by other members of our team. Uh, and I had a student named Jay Nagaswaran that designed a kernel uh, that really made GPUs parallel, uh, paralyzing the parallelizing the neurons and the synapses, uh, and that kernel to this day is so well done. It is still at the core of Carlson. Uh, I don't, I don't think any other simulator uh, can do the kind of optimization that, that Jay's uh, idea came through. And then over the years, we added an API, so it was more usable. Analysis tools. Uh, people started using multi-core. CPUs, so we made it so you could do hybrids of those things. Uh, a lot of people started using Python, so we put a Python front end on it and made it uh, Pine compatible. And um, and we also had some uh, collaborators that uh, made a pipeline. I'll talk a little bit about that, so you can co-simulate uh, these models uh, on neuromorphic hardware. And uh, most recently. We've kind of cleaned it up, added a lot more neuromodulation features. Uh, we kind of put Windows support on the shelf for a while, and we were able to bring it back with some nice work by a, a, a collaborator, Lars Niedemeyer. And also in that time, we, uh, we added axonal uh, plasticity and delays. So um, <laughs> no, this is busy. <laughs> And probably everyone, there's probably people here that have developed some of the simulators we're comparing Carlson with. Uh, and of course, you know, you probably have a table like this where all the X's are filled up for our simulator and everyone else's has blanks. But uh, I just wanted to, not may, maybe the boast, but not completely boast, but just show some of the things that it can do. It has a lot of power, uh, both for large scale, biologically plausible, uh, and or efficient machine learning type spiking neural nets. Um, as you can see, there's all kinds of variables, variants of plasticity, uh, different synapse models, different tools, uh, programming in C++, but if you prefer Python, there's, there's a, 
a front end for that. And at the back end, we support all sorts of CPUs and GPUs. The basic, I won't go through each of these details, but the basic setup, the way this works is you have a configuration where you just set up your network um, and initialize it or configure your network and it gets initialized and then you get set up some of the monitors so you can monitor uh, what's going on in your network at the spiking at the neuron level or the connection level or the population level. And then, uh, then you start to, you can run it. And during runtime, uh, you can actually inject outside, you know, in, inputs from outside or, or do things internally. Uh, there's plus on spike generators, so you can hook up sensors or, uh, or take, you know, uh, images and things like that and, and pump it into your, your network. And at the neuron level, we support currently leaky integrate and fire neurons, uh, Isikavich neurons. Um, so Isikavich neurons have, you know, both the four parameter and the nine parameter, and even we support the multi-compartment Isikavich neurons. Uh, so if you really want to try and match uh, specific uh, biological details of single neurons, you can. Uh, but if you're more interested in, in just having a, you know, lightweight, efficient, a network, then you can use the uh, leaky and a great fire. And we, you can either expand it with your own neuron model or work with us uh, to get the neuron model in the, the main code so that it's uh, nice and efficient. Uh, we have synapses. We have, uh, right now we're supporting spike timing dependent plasticity and homeostasis uh, and um, neuromodulated spike timing de dependent plasticity. Uh, we have AMPA, NMDA, GABA receptors, axonal delays. So that means you can run this either current-based KUBA or conductance-based COBA uh, with, with some of these channels. And you can also define your own uh, uh, receptors or ion channels. Um, yeah. And it is computationally efficient. Um, it, this is some old, uh, uh, a couple of versions, maybe Carlson five version, uh, just looking at how it how the speed up is uh, compared to CPUs and um, and also how close we can get to uh, execution in real time. And so, you know, we can still, and actually this we're better than this now, but we can get you know close to real time, like a uh, hundred thousand neurons uh, with millions of synapses. And uh, there's definitely a big speed up over uh, over CPUs, uh, but it depends also on the network. Sometimes as a network, you, you want a bunch of small um, spiking neural networks separately running in parallel. Sometimes a, a CPU can be better. Uh, so uh, the parallelization at the neuron and synapse level really, uh, really makes a, a difference with this. So we can run very large scale uh, computationally efficient models. And you know, with that brief background, I'm, I'm going to spend some time just doing some case studies of how it's been used recently, uh, both by our group and some of uh, other groups that that have uh, that have used it. So the first one is from Giorgio Ascoli's group at uh, George Mason University, and this I just want to show this model briefly, just to show uh, the level of detail. Uh, I know. A lot of you, for, at least from the talks I saw so far, uh, are interested in machine learning, but some of you may be more interested in, uh, you know, more computational neuroscience, um, which is what Ascoli's group is doing. And he's very interested in the hippocampus. He's got a project called Hippocampome, um, which has characterized uh, the Dendritic architect, dendritic trees, and also the uh, the firing behavior of all types of neurons uh, that you can find in the hippocampus. And in this project, he concentrated mainly on CA3 part of the hippocampus. And this just shows you the different types of neurons. Uh, so he also in the hippocampome has the connectivity map, and that's kind of showing the layers of the hippocampus, this part of CA3 and where the different cells are, and also how they are connected to each other. So they were able to put all this detail 
uh, into the model. And, um, and at a level uh, that is on scale with, with the mouse DA3. Uh, so this model is basically as, as big as, as the real brain uh, of a mouse at least. And so in this area, now we, they had almost 500,000 neurons and over 250 million synapses blows me away. Um, and they ran like basically a resting state model. So, so they gave it a little bit of a drive, but then they just wanted to see if the, the, uh, the model was stable. And they ran, so they ran a bunch of simulations um, for nine seconds, and then they kind of let it kind of calm down and looked at the last five seconds. And the, the firing behavior of the different uh, of the different neurons within CA3 were comparable to uh, real neurons in, in CA3, as well as the local field potentials. So this is really promising. Um, and I think they did it on one GPU. Uh, so a very powerful new GPU at the time. Uh, and so we could probably we are actually working with another group and trying to scale this up across, you know, a cluster of GPUs so they can actually get full scale hippocampus or, or whatever other brain region. So that shows you kind of the power, especially if you're interested in biological details. Um, another reason we developed it for and wanted to make it efficient, we do a lot of work with embedded systems and robotics. And uh, this is a few years old, but it'll give you an idea of the size network that we can run in real time with real sensors. So this was work. Uh, by my, my former student, Michael Baylor, and former uh, uh, postdoc, Nick Oros, Or and uh, my longtime collaborator in the computer science department, uh, Nick, uh, Nick Duck. So Michael was very interested in the dorsal wear visual pathway, you know, the, the so-called, uh, there's a what pathway and a where pathway. So the where pathway, again, starts with V1, but then it has projections to an area called MT that can, um, that responds to the speed and direction of movement. And then that projects to parietal cortex in an area of MST, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, the parietal cortex uh, is actually important for kind of setting up a premotor kind of signal uh, to drive uh, some sort of decision or behavior. And so he wanted to model this, and he took a, a well-known model of V1 called the spatial temporal energy model. Uh, and this was, this was not a spiking network. This was actually a, a bank of space-time oriented filters, so it was rate-based. Uh, but it was highly optimized using CUDA. And then it went to a spiking model of MT and using Isikiewicz regular, oops, regular spiking and fast spiking neurons, uh, it, the whole network became about 150,000 neurons with about 40 million synapses. But it needed to run in real time because it was going to control a robot. And if you're interested in how MT works, there's cells that actually respond to the components. So if you imagine, you're, you're moving through an environment and there's, it's a busy environment. There's lots of little bits and pieces depending on where it is in your visual field that are moving in different directions. But your perception is the overall pattern uh, of, uh, of the movement. So you kind of put, you put these things together and pull them together and then you're able to perceive what the overall type of movement is. And the, and the MT has both cells that are selective to the components of motion and cells that are uh, selective to the overall pattern of motion. And that becomes very important for uh, solving this kind of problem. The problem he had was he took this robot, uh, which was developed by Nick Oros, and Nicholas uh, is French, so we called it uh, Le Carl. Carl, by the way, Carl Sim, I should have said that at the beginning. Uh, our lab is called the Cognitive Anteater Robotics Laboratory. And um, in the United States, universities have mascots. So the mascot 
and there's a long history. You can ask me in Q&A if you're really interested. Uh, the, the mascot of the UC Irvine is the anteater. So Cognitive Anteater Robotics Laboratory becomes the acronym CARL. So he developed this robot, uh, which is a nice inexpensive way to get a powerful robot. This is a smartphone mounted on just an RC car with a bunch of sensors. And so we can take the frames from the smartphone and run it through our, our model and go through the different stages. And then we have both the self motion, which is the stream on the left, and the decision network, which is the stream on the right. And both the self motion and a, a goal that it's trying to reach drive whether the robot should go left or right. And let me just show you the network in his setup, the GUI he set up. So he's just Sitting, Michael's just sitting at his desktop, moving the camera around. So the camera, the self motion is generating. Hopefully, uh, the vectors show up nicely uh, with the movement. Uh, and so it's nicely in real time showing uh, motion due to self motion. And then this huge finger comes in. So it's also capturing the motion of the, fi the, the finger. So that was nice, it's working in real time. So it looks like it should work uh, on a robot. And so here's the robot eye view in a corridor. And it's basically using a balance equation. So the more motion activity on the left will cause it to move right and vice versa. So it's always trying to balance uh, the left and right motion. So what that nicely does is very smoothly uh, will avoid obstacles and make nice smooth trajectories. And now let me show you from the other view. Wait for the big robot reveal. There it comes. And so we're, this is actually replicating a whole bunch of experiments that were done in virtual reality with humans. And so the trajectories are following the way a human would, would navigate something you know, scaled like this. So you see it adjusts depending on the different uh, number of obstacles. Now this last bit, which shows the, the chair, this would actually not work if you were just using V1 or the component, but because you're using the pattern cells in MT, it's seeing the overall motion uh, of that whole chair instead of just the legs. And so that's a nice demonstration of the difference between pattern and component. Uh, and there was a lot of analysis showing that it, uh, having using the pattern cells actually gives you more smooth, more human-like trajectories. Okay, another feature that we developed over the years uh, and have been using recently was the automated parameter tuning. Uh, we paired up with uh, some experts in evolutionary algorithms and evolutionary computing from George Mason University. Um, and the basic idea was using some sort of evolutionary algorithm with you can define whatever fitness function you want. And then we can use the different mutation and selection properties of uh, in evolutionary algorithm libraries. But what's nice about CarlSim is now you can have multiple spiking neural nets running in parallel. So you can have the individuals uh, in this, in your generation running in parallel. So it really speeds up uh, the search uh, using the evolutionary algorithms. And we started with evolutionary computation in Java, uh, ECJ, and then uh, switched or didn't switch, but we support now both of them, uh, the library for evolutionary algorithm in Python or, or Leap. Uh, so we have these two different libraries with uh, both can do uh, similar things, but I think uh, they have different features and different programming languages, depending on how you want to do it. But there's a parameter tuning interface that's integrated with CarlSim. So you just have to set up a, a basically your spiking neural net, and then some of the parameters in ECJ or LEAP. And then uh, you can just run your simulation 
and evolve <clears throat> whatever features you want. It's up to you. Um, we've done this in a, a number of projects, and one of them, uh, going back to that dorsal visual stream, uh, is cortical motion perception. And uh, we're going to evolve the spike timing dependent plasticity rules. And this was work again by Michael Baylor, but also uh, it was part of Kashin Chen's uh, dissertation. And this was recently published in, in J Neuroscience. So this is basically a learning to learn algorithm. So we're evolving the learning rule. And, you know, we could evolve, you know, all the, the connection weights, but, you know, like I showed you, there's, there's potentially millions of connection weights. So that's a huge parameter space. So we said, what if you evolve the um, STDP rules? So you have an STDP, four open parameters, A plus, you know, the amplitude, uh, the time constant, and these are for LTP, and the same amplitude and time constant for LTD. And um, there's stability issues with STDP. So over, over the years, we, we realized we need to add to Carl Sim uh, a homing static uh, plasticity kind of synaptic scaling rule. Uh, and so another open parameter is the target firing rate. So we have a bunch of inhibitory excitatory cells. Uh, and so we, we search for what the appropriate target rate would be for those. Uh, and we have a bunch of different um, plastic connections. And so we, uh, we had separate parameters for those. And, but it's a small number of parameters. It's on the order of 20 parameters that, that we have to search. But the big question is, will this work? And uh, <clears throat> here's the setup. We took optic flow patterns. And uh, these optic flow patterns were just general ones, but some of them were actually used from uh, experiments that were done with uh, primates. And they feed into a bank of MT spiking neurons. These MT neurons have, like real MT neurons, have a preferred speed and direction. Those project to an area called MST, which seems to have more complicated self-motion uh, receptive fields. And um, we also have a bunch of inhibitory interneurons in this area. And the idea is to select based on how close can we use the weights from MST to reconstruct the optic flow pattern that was given to it. And like I said, we're going to involve the STDP parameters. So we have this nice loop that goes back and forth for uh, a number of generations. And we're running, you know, fifth, I think 15 to 20 spiking neural nets in parallel for each generation. And lo and behold, after doing this, <laughs> we get sets of connection weights. You can think of this as a basis vectors or basis, you know, basis vectors. And you can also look at the activity if, as these project to MSTD. And then based on the population of this activity, you can reconstruct very nicely, it turns out, after uh, I'd say about 20 generations, uh, you can reconstruct the original uh, flow pattern. Um, and hopefully you notice that this is kind of a sparse code. So it's, it's doing what we call dimensionality reduction. There's a huge number of neurons in the MT layer and a much smaller number of neurons in the MST layer. So we tried bases of 16, 36, 6,400, and 144. So there's this dimensionality reduction going from MT to MST. And there's also this very sparse coding, which uh, actually has some really interesting properties. And I'll talk about that in a moment, what that might mean. Um, so we looked at the population, uh, how, how uh, sparse was the population, and it's, it becomes pretty sparse, uh, sparser if you have more basis vectors, but uh, it seems like 64 is a nice sweet spot. And you know, how, how sparse, you know, how often does a neuron fire during its lifetime? That's another way of measuring sparsity, and that, that was also a sparse code, so it shows nice sparse coding. Does it actually look like a real MST? Well, it turns out it does. <laughs> um, here's some data we went, this is just one example, I'll show you a few, but we went through a whole bunch of data uh, from the monkey and it was able to replicate, uh, you know, 
um, receptive fields for single neurons that respond to rotation and translation and elevation. This is our model here in the spiking neural net. Uh, Michael had done a similar task or a yeah, similar project, but he used machine learning uh, dimensionality reduction uh, algorithms one called non-negative matrix factorization with a sparsity constraint. So we found that it was interesting that it was basically this model was actually replicating MST and actually evolving the spiking uh, S spike time independent plasticity parameters was also doing that. So it, it's making a, a theory or a hypothesis that STDP, STDP plus homeostasis is doing dimensionality reduction and uh, in sparsity uh, in the brain. Uh, and we looked and there's evidence of this, not just in this area, but multiple areas in the brain. But that's, you know, uh, important, but also important is at the population level, it's showing similar properties uh, with similar kind of groupings of preference for the azimuth and elevation. And um, both in the non-negative matrix factorization and also the spiking neural net model. And also uh, if you want to use this model, because obviously animals use this code, uh, one of the things they do is to figure out where they're heading through space. Uh, and so uh, you can decode uh, the MST model and actually get very accurate heading direction, uh, as accurate as, a, as another neural network model that, um, that was based on uh, some uh, uh, monkey data again. So very, very, uh, so the, the, it has the properties of a real primate brain MST. And it also has information uh, about heading direction and probably other important self-motion information. Okay, another interest of people in spiking neural nets, and obviously with this group, uh, is neuromorphic hardware. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, we've been collaborating with Anup Das's group at Drexel, and also uh, Frankie Kathur's group in IMEC, and. Uh, They've made a pipeline using Carl Sim to actually take neural nets, sometimes taking CNNs, converting them to SNNs, and then co-simulating them uh, for different neuromorphic hardware with the idea that eventually uh, you would see that the timing and everything is, is good, and then you could port it to your neuromorphic hardware and save a lot of time and, and uh, tears <laughs> working with a neuromorphic hardware. Um, this is the pipeline. So they've been working with us closely with Carlson, but uh, they they also have plans to to do this with Brian Nest and maybe Neuron. Uh, but yeah, so the overall thing is you start with uh, artificial neural net, you convert it to SNNs, you then put it on a simulator, and then you can map it, and then you can try it out on different neuromorphic hardware. And they've tried this on a few neuromorphic hardwares. And this is also an extension of, of Carlson uh, that, that is available. And actually, since there's a lot of interest, uh, that's one of the things on our to do list to, uh, to continue working on this with, with uh, a noops group at, at Drexel. So it supports, you know, you, if you have a neuromorphic application, you can, you can explore it and see, make sure it works. Uh, you can also tune it to a platform design. Uh, and do the co-design and co-optimization and go back and forth and uh, save a lot of time and, and, and worry. Okay, I am doing well on time. Let me go through uh, one more example and then I'll wrap up. As I mentioned, and it was nice to see this morning, uh, this morning for me, sorry, earlier in, in the session, uh, experienced uh, axonal plasticity. So we're also interested in experience dependent uh, plasticity. And uh, I've done some work outside of Carlson with this. And then Lars Niedemeyer uh, got interested in this and brought it into Carlson and did some really nice scaling up of it. So it turns out, and I guess uh, we discussed this earlier today, uh, the white matter is plastic, which uh, I didn't know until recently. I ran across this paper a few years ago. Uh, and that kind of blew me away. <laughs> uh, 
So <clears throat> you always think of the synaptic plasticity, but the myelin sheath, uh, due to experience, can get thicker, and that makes the transmission uh, faster along the axon. And then you have these nodes of Ranvier, and they're kind of like repeater signals so that uh, the signal doesn't attenuate. So you can also uh, make these plastic, or the, they are also plastic, so the number of nodes uh, actually can change due to experience. Both these things make the conductance faster and probably helps to synchronize. Uh, it's very obvious in diseases of white matter that, that movements become uh, very difficult. Uh, but in the mouse, they've shown that if you do a mouse with a learning task, the better mouse learners have more white matter in, in certain brain areas. Um, and this has been shown in, in humans doing imaging uh, that humans who are you know, highly skilled, let's say in music, have, have more white matter in key areas compared to a, a naive person like myself, let's say. Um, so I was excited to see this and said, hey, this would be worth exploring. And I, we started with, and this is work that came out of Telluride um, by uh, Tiffany Hu, uh, who was a student at, one of my students at UCI. And one of the ideas in robotics path planning is wavefront propagation. So she made this so it was a spiking wavefront. So each one of these circles is a neuron, and the upper left is where you want your agent or robot to start. The lower right in the red is where you want it to go. This area in the middle is kind of difficult to get through. And so the difficulty is encoded in the delay between neurons. So there's a longer delay going from a neuron that's outside, you know, in the nice green area to the kind of rough gray area. And just to show you how this propagates, causes neighbors to fire, there's a delay in the middle where that gray area is. First neuron to get to the goal. Now we have the address event representation and we can read out the path. And typically this gives you uh, a close or, or optimal path uh, to take given this situation. Now what's not here though is plasticity. So all these weights, all these delays are given. So you want to make this plastic. And we came across some work by Wolfgang Moss's group, by Bellick and all, it was in Nature Communications in 2020. And in a recurrent neural net, you can actually do back propagation through time by having an eligibility trace. So let me show you in this example, which is related to the one I just showed you. Let's say you have all these neurons fire in that wave propagation. And let's say I had a robot. And as the robot moved through all these places, it could use with its sensors how far, how hard it was to traverse through these different places and even look close to those places and, and know about something about the environment that other places nearby were, you know, close by within its sensor range uh, had a certain cost. And then the more recently uh, active neurons are more eligible. So that's the eligibility trace. Then you can apply any loss function. And in our case, where our loss function is how different is from what you sensed to what, uh, to what the actual cost was of moving through there. And then you can apply that loss to the, the most eligible neurons. And it's applied to the axonal delays. And so we're able to put this into CarlSim. Uh, we're able to put this on mazes. Uh, we're able to also use Izakevich neurons so that we have an in kick off a spike with excitatory neurons and then use inhibitory neurons to make sure it doesn't kind of reverberate. And we can scale this up to very large scale, you know, networks with large scale paths, or we can do smaller scale and, and replicate certain studies. Um, one of the studies, was work uh, we've done with a group that are doing human navigation and virtual reality where they have to, uh, these subjects in the virtual reality room kind of walk around a, a fixed route, learn a path. After they've done that around six times, they're put in different landmark locations and told to go to another 
landmark. And during the initial training, our, our network shows a lot of activity on the first loop. And then over time, that activity becomes uh, more confined to where that path is. And that's uh, similar to activity you would see in the hippocampus, uh, where there's a lot of activity during kind of uncertainty and then less activity when you're, you're more know where you are. But what I thought was interesting was uh, just like humans, it actually learned novel shortcuts. So uh, telling it to go to from you know here to there, uh, instead of taking the learned route, it actually picked a shortcut that it never had done during training. And that's something that uh, Bunadal, who did the human work, uh, actually saw in, in some humans. Some humans take a fixed route, some humans take a, a novel shortcut. And we also did a, a maze task called the Tomo Detour Maze that's, that's used in a lot of rodent studies. So the idea there is you have the rodent or the agent learn to go along the straight line from left to right several times till it's learned it well, and then you block it. So if you block it here, the middle panel, uh, the rat will actually, without much having, without much time, will rapidly adapt and take a detour. And so does our model. It rapidly adapts with this. Uh, and if you put the block here, it actually rapidly adapts like the mouse or rat, but it actually, it learns that this is the shorter detour. So it doesn't take the long detour, it takes the shorter detour. And so over time, the loss and the neural activity in all these test cases seems to uh, seems to calm down after some initial kind of uncertainty and a lot of activity. The axonal plasticity, because it's just, uh, after all these years of working with synaptic plasticity, I think this is kind of a, a open area and there's a lot of power to it. Uh, we, we use this EPROP algorithm, uh, but I think there's a lot of other, and we, we, uh, we could support a lot of other learning rules besides the, uh, the EPROP. Uh, and, and it's inside Carlson now, and you can apply the, at least the ones where, where uh, we support for the moment, STDP, synaptic facilitation, synaptic depression. Uh, and so it has a lot of applications as, as we saw earlier today, uh, you know, on, on speech recognition, uh, but also timing circuits and maybe motor learning. Okay, wrapping up, coming soon. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll open it up for any questions uh, or suggestions. So the future plans, uh, we, we do a lot of robotics. And so we, we're uh, developing an interface, an IO interface based on uh, YARC, which is used for the iCub project. Uh, and so uh, this shows basically uh, how this interface, at least early work on it, uh, shows that you can do a simulation of WeeBots and then put it on the real robot and get nice work. And you can set this up. Uh, a lot of people have asked for uh, a GUI. So, so we also uh, develop, are developing a GUI. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's coming soon. That's work in progress. Uh, we've also work in progress, uh, improving the installation, documentation, tutorials. There's a lot of documentation out there, a lot of tutorials if you want to try this out. Uh, but I think it could be improved from what uh, we, we know and what people have told us. So we're working on that. And there's some other things coming down the road. So uh, I'm, I'm excited this project's really uh, become mature and, and is going to continue. So I'll wrap up here. Uh, this is a framework, uh, hopefully motivates new projects. Uh, hopefully you want to use it. It's quite mature. There's the QR code if you want to go right to the GitHub, uh, if you have a camera on you. Um, and I think it also is important for neuromorphic computing and uh, you know, both computational neuroscience and neuromorphic computing. And now with a new interface, uh, hopefully embedded systems and robots. So thank you for your attention and hopefully there's time for questions. All right, thanks uh, Jeff uh, for uh, this great talk. Uh, we have uh, about five minutes uh, for questions. So I'll get started straight away. The first one is from Jan Vogelsang uh, from Yiddish Research Center. Why are there so many different simulators for SNNs that all do roughly the same thing? Why is the manpower invested in development of a single simulator instead? 
Yeah, uh, geez, <laughs> that's an existential question. You know, uh, computer scientists, no one wants to use someone else's code. <laughs> uh, so so that, that's a part of it. I, I don't know why there's so many. Uh, some have come and gone. Uh, what I never expected was, you know, when we started this project that it would still live on, um, which uh, I'm excited about. Uh, and I think there's a need for it. And uh, it is hard because, you know, this is a tool. It's actually harder to kind of keep tools alive over a long term than it is to just do one off interesting, what we call discovery science. Uh, so we've been fortunate, uh, and I show the support on the right, but that's only some of it. Like over the years, uh, different. Uh, different agencies have supported us to continue working on this. What we're trying to do now is actually make it completely self-supporting. So we have some plans for that uh, so that uh, this can live on. Uh, so yeah, I think there's a lot of manpower because these things start and then they run out of funding and then they die off. And, and that's just a shame. We, we do need more tools. All right, going to the next one, which is from myself. Um, is there any path or plan to implement auto differentiation and Carlson relatedly how uh, about your actually I'm reading I could just ask you how about compatibility with uh, this open neural network exchange format which is about computational graphs which which open network oh well um, basically auto differentiation and the mapping of say tensorflow or PyTorch computational graphs onto Carlson oh okay um I think Anoop and Drexel are doing that uh, and, and want to do that because uh, that's some of the things that, that they're doing. Um, so, and and working with them, they they uh, they need a little more help, and so we're trying to set up to actually to do further further that so that we can support that. Um, and, and also the TensorFlow and PyTorch kind of algorithms to actually directly map those to Carlson, if I understand correctly. All right, sounds good. Uh, next question, uh, which is actually a three in one. Do you model axonal dendritic delays for the first? Uh, second, um, if so, can they be learned like a function of synaptic activity? Well, I think you already answered this towards the end of your talk. Uh, can any generic parameter be defined and updated slash learned with the spike timing? Um, let's see. So. Yes, we're supporting delays, and now they are plastic. And now, in Carlson at least, uh, you can use any of our supported learning rules. Um, so the open plasticity is per connection and, uh, and per synapse. And George Mason University in their large-scale project also wanted us to have um, different connections so different projections. So you define a projection from, from one group to another. Uh, and so now you can set the parameters for each projection type. It used to be all the postsynaptic neurons had the same uh, parameters for the learning rules. So now uh, both in short-term plasticity and, and longer-term plasticity, it, it, you can set that depending on the connection type because that's what's happening apparently in, in the hippocampus. Hmm. All right. Um, so the next question is from uh, Puya. I don't know the uh, uh, the affiliation, but how compatible is it with the available hardware? Uh, Louis He Spinnaker. I'm assuming that it is Carlson. Yeah. Um, I know the group at Drexel has done um, Louis He. Uh, I think it's also done. One of the uh, one of the neuromorphic chips by uh, Yakimo Indiveri's group, uh, and those are the only two I know off the top of my head. Oh, actually, um, it's not out yet, but also uh, Brain Chips Akita chip. Uh, I know we, they've tested it, and uh, we're we're talking to them about uh, incorporating that. So, so those are the ones I know. I think they have plans to do uh, more of those. I don't know about North Pole, though. That's a, a totally different animal, <laughs> uh, IBM's latest. All right. Uh, 
Next question uh, is from Catherine Schiffman, um, also from Yiddish Research Center. One issue large scale simulations run into is that simulation time at scale is dominated by communication spike delivery, leading to insufficient utilization of GPUs. As the actual computation is very lightweight. Can the same be observed in call centers implementation? And there are there any workarounds? Well, CarlSim is quite efficient moving, moving data around on a single GPU. Um, actually, the CPUs get faster when there is a lot more, inter, you know, a lot more communication uh, because, uh, because of just the memory structure. This is something that Lars is working on. Um, I guess I can say he's working with a group at USC that, that has plans to put their models on clusters. Uh, and so uh, he's going to try and address that because the, the problem we've seen is if you want to go across boxes or across uh, cards, uh, then the communication goes through slower uh, buses and also through different memory that, that's slower. So that's something that they're addressing because um, from what I understand, they're, they're kind of stealth mode right now, but the, the scale of... of uh, of that project is is much larger than anything we've done, and so they they really need it to run, you know, maybe not real time, but close enough so they can actually get data. So, uh, so we are working on that. But but actually, we're very good if you're within the same card or box. Hmm. All right. Uh, the next speaker is having some issues, which uh, means that we still have time for some questions. <laughs> All right. Um, right away. So the next one is also uh, from Catherine. How detailed are Carl Sim neuron models? You mentioned that it's capable of very large simulation, uh, such as NEST, but at the cost of reducing neurons to a point model, does the same apply here, or is there some kind of trade-off? Yeah. Um, so if you want detail, we right now we're, we're supporting the Izakevich neuron, uh, both the four-parameter, nine-parameter. When we were working with uh, earlier, uh, neuron models with the Askeley group, they couldn't fit some of their types to point neurons. So we also came up with an efficient way to model compartments, not at the, not, not a, like a Hodgkin Huxley like a compartment, but uh, having different compartments so you could kind of separate out uh, the dynamics of dendri dendrites and, and somas. I, you know, we, were, we didn't go beyond like maybe eight compartments. Uh, but that actually, the dynamics between those uh, compartments actually allowed them to fit uh, a lot of more, a lot of more interesting neuron types. Uh, so that's that's the level we can do. Uh, I was talking yesterday with a group we're working with from George Washington University. They have different neuron models uh, they want to develop, so we're working with them. Uh, we're very open to doing that, uh, and uh, usually you can work with our group. Uh, work as a developer and then uh, we'll, we'll do eventually the testing and incorporate it so it goes in the mainline release. Uh, so yeah, uh, the nice thing about the way we've done it is you can do hybrid. So you, right now you can do leaky and a grade and fire and the different Izakevich neurons, you know, separate them out and have them within the same simulation. Okay, let's go with the final question. Um, so actually, I'm interested in this one. So what SDDP rule results from the evolution? Oh, yeah. Um, they actually look like normal SDDP rules. They, don't, they aren't anything really eccentric or exotic, uh, which I'm surprised by. Uh, in another project that Kashin did, that, that, looked, that tried to match data we got from a, a group that was recording from the hippocampus, and the subiculum, uh, your learning rules look like your vanilla STDP rules, but uh, subiculum is more active, and so it had less uh, area under the LTD curve compared to the hippocampus, and it matched their data nicely. Um, yeah, I was surprised. I thought you'd see some really bizarre curves. Uh, I think, I think it's just it seems like the brain is doing this dimensionality reduction in sparsity. And if, uh, if you get the parameters right, uh, but within that kind of basic, you know, vanilla STDP plus the homeostatic scaling, uh, you get 
dimensioning redu reduction in, in sparsity, and that seems to be what downs a lot of downstream brain areas uh, are doing to the information they're getting. All right. Okay. Well, uh, Jeff, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, yeah, my pleasure. And here's my contact information. You know, if you have any further questions or, or want to try it out, you know, feel free to reach out to me and I'll, I'll get you hooked up. All right. And we'll see you uh, in the next talk by Alexandria Fermont. All right. Thank you, everyone.